Okay, I think we can start. Dear members of the Proisi Association, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's my very great pleasure to welcome all of you, those being present here in the lecture hall and all of you being remotely connected to our first Proisi talk in this year, 2020. Thanks a lot for coming, those sitting here in the lecture hall, and also thanks a lot to all of you following us tonight via Zoom. As you know, on normal circumstances, we would have already had today our third Proisi talk in this year. But of course, nothing is normal in this very special year 2020. And as the members of the Proisi Association know quite well, we were communicating this year mainly via postal mail to you, but not in other means. And maybe just to briefly recapitulate how it was this year on 9th of March, we had to inform you that the talk we will hear tonight, which was originally scheduled for 18th of March, will need to be postponed due to the ongoing Corona crisis. And we wrote then to you in our letter at that time that we hope to be able to organize it in May or maybe early June, when we usually have our second Proisi talk. But also this plan, as you all know, did not work out and on 28th of May, we had to write you a second letter announcing that we had to definitely shift the long-awaited talk to October. That's where we are now. And until last week, indeed, we were quite confident that we can organize, indeed, an in-person Proisi talk tonight. But the now, again, very strongly increasing case numbers let us really seriously doubt whether this would be a good idea. And we decided to give it a try for a virtual presentation, as this is definitely more appropriate during these very special times. And I'm really very thankful that Professor Leibundgut, our tonight's speaker, agreed to give the presentation remotely from his office in Munich. So thanks again for your commitment to make this experiment here tonight with us. Of course, it is very clear that the experiments, the experience of this evening will most probably not be exactly the same as it used to be for our past Preuss events. There will be, of course, no opportunity to directly interact with the speaker in an informal way after the talk at the upper as we are used to do so uh, under normal circumstances. Senses. This most relevant part will be completely missing tonight. I'm really sorry for this, but uh, we cannot do anything about this. And we can just hope that relatively soon in the future, we will be able to organize price events again as we all know and love them, of course. But we are convinced that despite the ongoing corona crisis, we will be able to provide you tonight with our online talk a possibility to share our fascinating about space research and tonight in particular about cosmology. And to some extent, we are getting anyway more and more used to this kind of virtual exchange. And we are sure that our tonight's presentation will be very stimulating and interesting. And having said this, it is now my very great pleasure to introduce to you our tonight's speaker, Professor Leibundgut. And I would like to cite a couple of uh, uh, steps in his curriculum vitae. So Bruno Leibundgut is, as the name might already imply, he is Swiss. He went to school in Switzerland, did his Matura, Eigenössische Matura, Typos B, in 1999 and then studied at the University of Basel Physics, Astronomy and Mathematics, where he graduated with diploma and later on moved to PhD studies in astronomy at the Astronomical Institute of the University of Basel, where he graduated in 1989. He then moved on in his scientific career, went as a postdoctoral research associate to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics between 1989 and 1992, then further on between 1992 and 1993 as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of California in Berkeley. And since 1993, he is a staff astronomer at the European Southern Observatory, ESO. Since 1993, he is there a member of the science division. In 1995, was working with the VLT program scientists as a VLT program scientist in the office of the director general. And between 1998 and 2001, as the head of the VLT data flow group within the data management division. Since August 2001 until 2008, he was the head of the Office for Science, and since February 2008 until 2014, the Director of Science, and since then, a VLT program scientist. Apart from this, he is an honorary professor at the Technical University of Munich, 
and he was awarded the Johannes Geis Fellowship in 2019. And based on this, I'm now very happy to give the floor to Professor Leibundgut to inform us about cosmology today. And before we start, I would just remind those of you that are following us online that please ask your questions either in the chat, we will read them afterwards, or raise in to the talk your hand that we see who has a question to ask. And with this, now definitely the floor is yours, Professor Leibungut, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I, as already said, I really would have loved to be in Bern. I had a wonderful time as the Johannes Geis Fellow between November and February, end of January, February uh, this year in at the ISI, and it was a it was a great time, and I had a wonderful time there. And I really miss the fact that I couldn't visit this time. So let's hope uh, this is going to work out. This is even a bit more of an experiment. I'm actually sitting at home, so this is my home office, and uh, we'll see how this talk goes. So I'll try to give you a little bit of a, an idea what's happening in cosmology today. Now, while I was in Bern as the Johannes Geis Fellow, there was an exhibition at the Kunstmuseum Bern, uh, and it had the title Alles Feld, Schweizer Kunst von Böcklin bis Wallotton. And in the brochure of this uh, exhibition, there was a quote which I thought was very interesting. And so it started off Sigmund Freud. This was actually uh, uh, from quote, uh, Freud, I think. So the quote goes, Sigmund Freud speaks of three major humiliations of human narcissism. The first one of these is the cosmological humiliation that came with the abandonment, abandonment of the geocentric description of the cosmos and was accompanied by the expulsion of the figure of the human being from the very heart of creation. The second humiliation, a biological one, comes with the advent of Charles Darwin and the realization that humans were not created in the image of one specific God, rather they are precarious fruit of the process of evolution that encompasses all species. The third humiliation is psychological and it and synonymous with the discovery of the unconscious, which undermined human beings as masters of their own house. So there's these three things, and I only talk about the cosmology, of course, I will not talk about the other things, I'm not qualified to do that. But I thought it was quite striking uh, that this exhibition was, was going through this uh, phase of revolutions, various revolutions uh, that have taken place. And I'll, I'll show you that cosmology has gone even a bit further than that. All right. Now, I also want to issue a warning uh, this comes from Fritz Zwicky. Many of you will know Fritz Zwicky. There's a uh, Fritz Zwicky Foundation in Switzerland. Uh, Fritz Zwicky said the following thing. This is in the introduction to his uh, morphological astronomy, which I have here. He says, my native country of Switzerland, in spite of the glorious achievements in theoretical astronomy by Euler, Ritz, and others, has never even had a start in observational astronomy. Now, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I had to look up who Ritz was because it, I, I wasn't aware of the famous theoretical astronomer, uh, Walter Ritz, as it turns out. Walter Ritz was from Sion, and he has uh, made seemingly contribution to spectroscopy. Uh, but nevertheless, um, Fritz, of course, is trying to put himself into the same uh, league like these people. I should have said that Fritz Zwicky, of course, had a home uh, in Gümlingen, very near uh, Bern uh, in the later years because he was trying to help the Swiss government in solve certain problems, which at some point the Swiss government told him they were not too interested in uh, his advice. All right, modern cosmology. So there's three parts to this, which is very basic. The first one is the universe yesterday. The second one is the universe today. And the third one is the universe tomorrow. Now you will see, I won't have much to say about the universe tomorrow. Uh, the future is hard to predict, um, but um, this is probably gonna be hard to read, I'm sorry. But what we, what we can learn about the universe yesterday, what happened in the past is it made elements. It made all the chemical elements that we know. And in particular, it made certain elements at particular times. So I wanted to talk about this. I will talk about what I call the first light of the universe, the, the cosmic microwave background, 
which uh, I will give you an indication. So that's about 300, maybe 350, 370,000 years after the Big Bang, after the beginning. And the next thing that we can look through is the evolution of the universe, the, the expansion as it expands, but also as it forms stars, as it, form, as it forms galaxies and structure. Now the universe today has two big puzzles in it. One is dark matter and the other one is dark energy. And I will we'll present to you what I think uh, what's the basis of those two things. And uh, tomorrow, well, so there's a little bit that we can sort of predict or hope what's going to happen. I do hope that we will have a time where we detect uh, dark matter particles. So what's the dark matter? What is it, what is it made of? And I have already have here uh, down here the neutrinos. There could be a connection between what the dark matter particles are and what the neutrinos are. The other thing which connects to the dark energy down here is the equation of state of the dark energy. And we have a mission, ESA has a mission uh, that's in development, actually they're in, in construction, and hopefully it will launch in the coming years, next year or the, the year after that, uh, which is called Euclid, which, which will help figuring out what dark energy is. And something that's already happened, uh, that's not only into the future, but that's already happening right now is the detection of gravitation waves from astrophysical sources. And uh, that I think has great promise for, for what the future will bring us. Now, I'm giving a pro-ISI talk here. I'm not the first one to talk about this. Uh, the very first spati spatium uh, that was published um, had the title, the Entstehung uh, des Universums, and that was uh, by Johannes Geis in April 1998. Now, the third one was also uh, about cosmology. Now, this is a beautiful image about, not really a cosmo cosmological uh, object, but uh, supernova, 1970, supernova 1987a. And this one uh, was given by uh, Gustav Tamman now. So Johannes Geis and Gustav Tamman, two of the uh, very important people in Swiss astronomy, uh, and also actually now proving it's like wrong that observational astronomers in Switzerland and also physicists can make a uh, big contribution contributions. Now I, I would I should also point out that uh, a few years later there is a spatium number seven in 2001. That was by um, Professor Pretzel from the University of Bern. That's about dark matter. And the other one, uh, which is from Rudi von Steiger, which is 2004, Woher kommt Kohlenstoff, Eisen und Uran. So uh, some of the topics that I will cover uh, in my talk have already been covered extensively before. And so that's why I called it modern cosmology to give you an update on where we stand. So let me start very basic. How do we observe the world? So we can look at it, of course, but we can do much more than only look at the world. And part of what my talk is gonna be about is how do we find out about things that we cannot see? So like uh, the biologists right now are looking for a virus that we can't see, but that's affecting us all very deeply. Uh, we as astronomers are trying to do a similar thing. We're trying to understand the world by looking at certain effects that uh, are not directly, if you want, visible. And I'll go through that in, the, in a moment. I thought I'd show you this. This is just a beautiful image that's put together of uh, the, the Earth at night. Now, this is several years already, so some of it has changed. And you see the outline of the, the continents as there is light. There's very striking features. Look how bright Japan is. Uh, look how India is bright and how the surrounding areas or the surrounding countries are actually not uh, lit up the same way. You have the Nile Valley here, uh, which is beautifully lit up. And then you have what's, what strikes me all the time is the densely populated Eastern part of the United States and the much less densely, well, this is the Midwest, of course, which is not as densely populated. And so just to give you an indication, um, uh, that's where we're sitting in the middle of this uh, very bright Europe uh, at the moment. But 
there's more. So how do we understand uh, where we live? And so this is a picture of a cross section of the earth. As you all know, the earth has a crust on which we live. Uh, it has, a, has an upper mantle, it has a lower mantle, it has an outer core and inter, inner core. And I'll get back to this a little bit later. But what I wanted to say here is, so you have a crust that's some, some tens of kilometers thick of, um, in an earth that's, that has a radius slightly more than 6,000 kilometers. And so you, we are living on a very, very thin crust. Now, at the, the other thing that I think is very interesting is we're living on the surface of that crust. We're living on the surface of the earth. We're not really drilling down into the earth. So the deepest uh, holes that we've ever drilled are 10, maybe 15 kilometers, but not much more. Now, the other part of our life area is this thing up here, this very thin sliver of air. So that's the atmosphere as seen from the space shuttle um, as it's flying upside down and the sun is coming up be behind the, uh, the, the tail of the shuttle itself. So this is the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere goes up, you know, stratosphere is 10 to 20 kilometers up in, into the, uh, above the earth, uh, the, the um, if you want the universe starts 100 kilometers up. So again, if you think about where, where, we where we see life, where we experience life, this is a shell on a planet and the, the thickness of that shell that we, that is our life area is some 20 kilometers, you know, 10 kilometers down into the crust, 10 kilometers up. So it's some 20 kilometers. It, on a sphere where the volume of that sphere is 6,000 kilometers cubed. You know, as a as a sphere. Now that small sliver that we're living up in in is something like three or four percent of the volume of the total Earth. Okay, so we we're, we're literally living on Earth and not in it or above it. So just to give you that picture, this is the place that uh, we're all living. Nine or ten billion people at this point. Uh, all crowded in that very little surface. So to, to drive that point home, this is a picture of from taken with Cassini, uh, uh, the Cassini probe, which now has flown into Saturn in the end. So this is Saturn. This is a solar eclipse. So the sun is eclipsed by the planet Saturn. Okay, so the, here you see the sun coming out. This is the, uh, the pearl ring as it's coming out. So the sun's coming out here. The sun is blocked by Saturn. Now, if you think about this, Cassini is looking towards the center of the solar system. And since it's looking towards the center of the solar system, the inner planets should be visible on this picture. And so the inner planets include the Earth. And so uh, to help you, I've blown this up. This here, is the earth, okay? This is where all the life is happening, where uh, a few weeks from now, some big country will elect a new president that may change life on this planet one way or another. This is where um, all of climate is changing or not change, well, it is changing, where all, we will have to find solutions to things like that. So uh, this is the place, this is our place in the universe, just to, and this is not even far away, this is just Saturn, this is just a little bit inside the solar system. Now, of course we can go a lot bigger, uh, our place in the Milky Way, this is not the Milky Way itself, this is a lookalike uh, at the University of Basel at the Institute where I did my studies, this was called the Basel uh, galaxy because the, in Basel people measured the positions of these bright uh, arms in our Milky Way. And turns out uh, that the arms that were measured for our Milky Way very much were similar to this galaxy, NGC 30, uh, 1232, um, that's been observed many times. And so if you take the place of the Earth, the Sun, the solar system in this Milky Way, as you all know, I think, uh, we're 27,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way. 
uh, out in a, a sort of interarm region between two sort of minor arms in this Milky Way. So this is one of those uh, Copernican, Copernican revolutions, if you want, or uh, what I quoted at the beginning, the humiliations of uh, humankind and humans. Now, so that was space. Let me talk a little bit about time. Time is very difficult to, to put together in astronomical facts. And so uh, what I'm trying to do here is, uh, this is an idea that Carl Sagan actually brought up. Uh, so we are mapping the history of the universe onto one year. So this, the universe starts with a big bang on the 1st of January at midnight and then evolves until uh, at the end of the year, um, uh, Sylvester at, at 12 o'clock, that's today. And so if you map the history of the universe onto one year, what's happening when? And so, as I said, we start with the Big Bang right here at the beginning. Um, January, February, the universe is developing in various ways. It's mostly cooling down. Um, and it's also then uh, creating the first atoms, I'll get to this. But the Milky Way, as we think it, the Milky Way would, in that year, would form around March, March, April, okay? The sun and the planets are not original, well, are not first generation in that Milky Way, okay? They're third generation, maybe even later. And so we think the sun and its planets, the solar system, formed around August in that year. So just to be clear, this is the second half of the year. So the sun and the planets formed in the second half of the history of the universe as we know it right now. It's very interesting that life develops rather quickly. So from August into September, you get the, the, the oldest life forms already. And then in November, you get the first multicellular organisms. This is pretty late in the year. Uh, so December, I've sort of blown up a little bit, so do you have, do you have a bit more? First half of December, nothing. And the 15th of December is, is where life really gets into, on this planet, really gets going. Okay, the Cambrian explosion is where many, many life forms are created. Uh, life spreads uh, across the planet. It's all, still all in the water, but it, it uh, spreads across the planet. You have emerges emergence of the first ver vertebrates on the 17th, the first land plants, so moving on to land from the oceans on the 18th, uh, first four-limbed, four-legged animals uh, around the 20th, and the insects start on the 21st of December in this year, okay? As a Christmas gift, as I always say, we get the dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs appear around um, the 24th of December, uh, the, you have the first mammals on Christmas day itself and the first birds on the 27th. On the 29th, so the, the dinosaurs managed to be alive on this planet for about a week in, in comparison to the universe. Uh, it's about 60 million years, actually more. Um, it's more like a, probably 150 million. Um, the dinosaurs are wiped out on the 29th. That's a very important event for us humans because the, the mammals start to develop really after the dinosaurs disappear from this planet because the dinosaurs were um, dominating the planet, it, it seems. So um, the other thing that I should say since I'm giving this talk in Switzerland or at least to many Swiss people, the Alps formed just around the time when the dinosaurs disappeared, okay? So around here, the Alps formed. And then uh, to move on to the end of the year, uh, the, the Homo sapiens appears about six minutes before minute, uh, midnight. The primates, the first forms of hominids are actually seven hours before midnight. The Homo sapiens as we know it is six minutes. Uh, the writing is 15 seconds before the, um, before midnight, before the year's out. And then uh, the pyramids uh, are built 10 seconds before the end. And one second, so you, you can see here 400 years, 500 years, uh, one second, uh, Galileo observes the, the sky with a telescope, that's the first. So you see 
how um, humans appear here at the very end of this development. Now, the last thing before I really get into the cosmology and I really, really should get going here uh, is the atmosphere. We're living under this atmosphere. I showed you that very thin sliver that we're under. And what, what's drawn here is how, if you have a, 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 a a ray, a, a light ray coming in from the universe towards the earth, how high will that light ray be stopped? Okay. And so if you're observing the radio, it gets all the way to the ground. So this on the right side here, you have the altitude above ground. So this is 10 kilometers, 20, 30, 40 kilometers, 100 kilometers, as I said, outer space sort of starts up here. So in the radio, you get the light all the way to the ground. The visible, so this is frequencies here, down here, uh, up here, because I'm, I'm more thinking in, in wavelengths of light. Uh, I'm, I have the wavelengths up here. So these are uh, light rays that have a wavelength of 300 meters. This is very long. Um, uh, this is the centimeter range, the radio range. And then we have down here the visible, which is typically in uh, a few hundred nanometers, uh, the micrometers to nanometers range. And then uh, you get here the, the high rate high energy radiation into the angstrom radiation or uh, into the uh, um, uh, MeV range, uh, energy range. So the radio reaches the ground, the visible reaches the ground, uh, but here the X-rays and the gamma rays are all blocked. They're all blocked high in the atmosphere, which is very good because if the UV radiation, if that part here would just move a little bit to the right, um, we'd all have a real problem with skin cancer. So uh, it's actually, the, the, the atmosphere is a real shield, it's protecting us. Uh, but you see at the same time, if you want to observe here or you want to observe here, you have a problem if you have your telescope on the ground. And so uh, just as an example, the radio telescopes uh, are typically white, big dishes that are sitting on the ground. Uh, you have, uh, this is a range, this is in here. Uh, this is the millimeter, submillimeter range where you have to go high up. This is on a plateau that's 5,000 meters above sea level in Chile. Um, this is from the ground in the visible, the, the very large telescope that we're using. And then you have uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which is in space to observe the UV, among other things. And then if you want to observe the gamma rays in the radio, you have to build a satellite. You cannot observe these things from the ground. And so this is, uh, as an example, Exxon and Newton. How does the sky look like if you look at the sky? So this is an example. So this is the sky, the whole sky. You cannot see that all by yourself because we only can see parts of the sky. But if you can map the whole sky, this is what you see. And so you see uh, the Milky Way. This, this is the, the plane of the Milky Way. You see these dust lanes here. And um, so I just marked this up. This is the visible range, and this is the Milky Way as it's formed here. Uh, here's an optical uh, observatory as it sits somewhere in, in the desert. These are stars. Okay, here's a, uh, here's a small galaxy, the Magellanic Cloud in the south. Here's another one, and that's the stars and gas. If you look at the sky, and this is a very recent image. This was uh, only published earlier this year. So this is now the sky in the X-rays. Okay, so this is out here. This is Erosita, which is a, a Russian German satellite that take, took this picture. And I'm just going to go back and forth just a couple of times. You see how this is a completely different sky. The universe appears very different in the X-rays than it does in the optical. So for example, here, this is a supernova uh, remnant, Poppies, which in the optical, you essentially don't see. Uh, you see here uh, another one, uh, the, the small dots, you see, have these plumes here, which uh, are coming from the center of the Milky Way, which you can see in the optical. Now, if you look at the sky now, at millimeter, sub-millimeter wavelengths, it looks like this. So this is, this is if you look at the sky at um, uh, about 150 uh, micrometers or something like that with satellites you see essentially as nothing. What you would see, what's not shown here, what you would see is the shadow of the sun and the shadow of the moon. Now, if you look harder, you will start to see things. So this is the cosmic microwave background. 
and it's uniform to better than one part in a thousand. So if you have a measurement that's not good enough to one part in a thousand, you will see exactly that that you see here. Now, if you if you become better, and this is really good, this is now in one part in a hundred thousand, then you see this. Then you see what I call the first light. This is now right at the beginning of this universe. Okay, this is about three hundred thousand years after the universe, the Big Bang has happened, and that was observed with the Planck satellite uh, in the past years. Okay, so I wanted to just show you this. Uh, I need to do this. I want to show you this uh, as a movie, just to give you an impression. So this is a Milky Way. It's our Milky Way, presumably. And we're now zooming in towards the Earth. Okay, so we're going uh, among the, these many stars. Here's the Earth. Let me just stop this quickly. This is the Earth, and you see the sun just behind it. What we're now going to do, we're going to map all these stars onto a sphere on the sky. So that's what's happening right now. So this is the sphere. That's the same galaxy that I showed you before, where you now have we folded up, and this is the galaxy I showed you before. Okay. So this is the galaxy in the visible. And what's going to happen now, we're going to have a slider on the bottom left that we're going to turn to the right, and we change the wavelength as we look at the sky. And so let's ha let's this happen. And so here's the infrared. This is the near infrared. And you see a very strong disk. This is all the cold, the coldish stars in the Milky Way plane. Uh, this is the far infrared. This is dust. This is warm dust in the Milky Way plane. The, the what you see sort of going across uh, this part here. This is in, in the uh, solar system. This is dust in the solar system. It's the zodiacal light uh, that you can see sometimes. And then we go to the submillimeter and we go all the way to the submillimeter. This is what I took, showed you before. This is the universe uh, at, at the microwave and it's, it's almost flat. Uh, there's a little of galaxy left here. And so what's happening now, we're gonna crank up the contrast. And so we go from uh, one in a thousand, this is now uh, the cold dust in the Milky Way, and it goes all the way up to what I showed you before, to the structure of the cosmos that's behind here. Okay, so um, let's, let's move to the uh, cosmology. There's four things that are important for cosmology. One is gravity. Um, as I will show you, gravity is the most important thing for the, for the current universe. Here is uh, Einstein's field equation if you, if you need to uh, memorize that. Um, and the two things that we're adding to this is uh, isotropy and homogeneity. So this is this picture here where I said it's, to, it's uniform to one part in a thousand. So, so it's very uniform. This is already the highest contrast that you can get at this point. So what we mean by isotropy is there's no preferred region in, in the sky and homogeneity means that there is no preferred regions. You can take regions in the universe, they have to be big, you average over these regions and you will always, you would think that on average, these regions are uh, the same, okay? Uh, the the a color, color, corollary for this is that there is no center of the universe. Now there's one fourth thing, uh, which I want to mention here because I, I, I won't talk about this anymore. This is uh, somebody thinking about this. Not quite sure she was thinking about that, but anyhow, um, the entropic principle. So we are a product of the universe. This universe not only created viruses, it also created the fact that you are listening to me giving this talk. And that's a condition on this universe. And we just don't quite know how to turn this into a physical principle. It is here, I, I listed it here as, a, as a, an important principle, but I will not use this anymore. Whereas these things I will use for the rest of the talk. So here is the current picture. This is a very quick rundown to the current picture to sort of, this could also almost be my summary slide. Do you see here Jim Peebles? Jim Peebles won the one half of the Nobel Prize last year, 2019, for his contributions to uh, uh, the cosmology. And this is essentially part of his contribution. So this is a universe uh, that starts here in a big bang and you see how it's sort of uh, expanding. Here's the Earth looking at this universe down here. And so you have uh, 
the primordial nucleosynthesis, I'll talk about this. That's right at the Big Bang. Then you have the cosmic microwave background. This is this thing that I already showed you. I will also talk about this a little more. Then you have what's typically called the dark, the dark ages where the universe is opaque. You don't see very, very much. Well, it's opaque to certain things. And then you have the structure formation. So this is where out of this mess of the cosmic microwave background, you then form gas, uh, sorry, you form galaxies and stars on, and planets down here. Uh, late time clusterings of galaxies, I get back to this, that this late time clustering has a direct uh, connection to the dark matter. And uh, there's this dark energy, this actually this pi here, this is the fractions of what's in the universe. So here are the atoms, this is us, this is 5%. There's about 26, 27% dark matter, and the rest is dark energy. Now, Jim Peebles has contributed to all of these things. Uh, I will talk about them, um, but he had, he's the one who contributed to these things. And so I'll go through some of these in the next things. But I get, let me go back to Carl Sagan. Um, so he said something very profound. Uh, I try to get this to my students that when I, when I do my cosmology lectures at the university, I always want to uh, cake, uh, uh, bake a cake, uh, an apple pie at the end to prove to them that the universe exists. Um, but uh, Carl Sagan said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. And it, it's very true. And so let me show you why I think he's right. So this is complicated. Uh, a graph, which is coming from CERN. So that's the reason it's complicated, I guess. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, this is time, time goes up. Uh, this is the Big Bang, this is us. And so forget about all these various things. The important things is the elements out of this Big Bang with all these question marks, um, we create electrons, neutrinos, and quarks, the basic, uh, the stepping, the basic um, particles that form nuclei. And so a little later, as the universe gets colder, you still have the electrons and neutrinos, you have the quarks, and uh, you start creating with these quarks triples that then become um, the protons and the neutrons. Okay, so out of these quarks, you form protons and neutrons, which are the basics of the nucleons uh, uh, in our atoms. Uh, you also have the Z particle and the W particle uh, that are forming at this point, and you start creating photons, light, okay? And so over here, now, you go from protons, so from the quarks, you get protons and neutrons, and in, at this moment here, which is about three minutes after the start, um, you, you have to take those protons and neutrons, and you form atomic nuclei. So you form hydrogen nucleus, the proton, or you form um, uh, helium, helium-4, and some trace elements, okay? And so uh, together with the electrons, later on here, these nucle nuclei uh, capture the, the free electrons here and form the photons, uh, form the atoms, I'm sorry. The, and what, me, what happens at this point, because you have no more free electrons, uh, the photons now can travel freely. So in here, they're bouncing off these electrons all the time. But as soon as the electrons disappear into the, into the atoms, uh, you get free travel. And that is the time when you see the microwave background. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. If you want to read about this, this is uh, Steven Weinberg wrote this beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, the first three minutes, it's been written in the 70s or the 80s last century fantastic thing how you go from the neutrons and the protons to deuterium and from deuterium to helium-3 or to tritium and then finally to helium-4. And there is a crime story here which I tell the students which I will not tell you now but the neutrons the free neutrons decay and if the neutron decay is too fast I have to refer you back to uh, this spatium here that's written by Rudi von Steiger. And so you should uh, read that, it's in there. If the neutrons decay too fast, actually the universe will not create LEN, any elements. Uh, so we have, we're lucky enough that the neutrons hold out long enough that we finally can uh, form the helium form. And this is the composition of the universe. The universe is made of hydrogen, 
about two, uh, three quarters. It's made of helium. And then since we're not chemists, um, everything that's not hydrogen and helium for astronomers is called a metal. Uh, that made it very easy for us. But you have three quarters hydrogen and about one quarter helium, and then you have a tiny little rest, okay? Now, as you realize, you can't make an apple pie with this. You need more elements. You need more metals, as we say. Now, since I was a Johannes Geis fellow, I thought I, I'd present you this. Um, Guys with the solar wind uh, sail on with the Apollo missions was the first to show that the helium-3 particles are coming from the sun and they're coming in the right number so that the universe is actually made the way we think it is made. That the, this Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the creation of the helium in the Big Bang in the first three minutes is actually um, correct. And so here's the measurement. This is from a graph that Hubert Reeves showed at the school when I was a student um, in Alpbach. And so this is the measurement, the burn measurement, as he called it, from these sails. And um, here is the helium-3 measurement. And so that's uh, where the universe should sit. And I'll sh no, I don't show you this, but this is exactly right. OK, this is right, bang on. So um, the end, the last sentence in this abstract of this paper in 1972 says, the deuterium and the helium-3 abundances in the protosolar gas are consistent with a big bang origin of these nuclei, corresponding to a universal baryonic density of three times 10 to the minus 31 grams per cubic centimeter, and a deceleration parameter of Q0 of 10 to the minus two, and zero leptonic numbers. Now, this turns out, they couldn't know about this, but this turns out uh, it's not quite right, uh, but this number is actually quite good, I think, still today. Ah, I thought I'd show you this picture because this is from that school, and um, Sylvia Wenger uh, was trying to help me to identify, but there are at least two current uh, directors of ISI on this picture, so I want to point out Rudy von Steiger here, and uh, here's Joachim Wamskans, uh, just to, and I'm sure there's other uh, ISI people on this picture, uh, if, I, I will not point out where I am on this picture because, um, well, we can work it out at some point. So the, the apple pie, pie uh, sort of bears the question, um, where are all these metals? And it's very interesting. The universe, if you look at the elements in the universe, the stars, they're hydrogen and helium. But the Earth, this is the Earth crust. This is the crust of the Earth. It's mostly oxygen and silicon, and then aluminum, uh, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, and then other metals here. But the human body is mostly oxygen in weight, okay? So, so you can take the Bible and you say, you know, you come from sand and you will return to sand. That's not quite true. Sand is silicon oxide, okay? Well, our body is mostly oxygen and carbon. And then there's hydrogen, and then there's nitrogen and calcium. So our composition is different from the Earth's crust, which is very, very, very different from uh, the composition in the universe. So that's uh, a question I will not go into. I wanted to fast forward because I need to uh, make sure that I finish at some point. I wanted to fast forward 300,000 years. So we just finished the first three minutes. And so now this is the moment where the atoms form uh, that's what's said here. And the photons decouple from the atoms. And so this is this layer here. This is what I would call the first light in the universe. And um, this had various uh, uh, discoveries. So this was discovered in 1965 by Penzias and Wilson. They won the Nobel Prize in the 1970s or 80s, I can't remember. Uh, that's what they saw. They saw a uniform, completely uniform radiation wherever they looked. It was all the same. They actually didn't quite see this part either. Now, the COBE satellite, which flew in the 1992, um, they, that won a Nobel Prize in 2006 to John Mather and George Smoot. They could discover these fluctuations from the very first um, photons in the universe. And WMAP flew in 2003 that hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet, 
Um, they, uh, this is the Milky Way. This is just dust in the Milky Way. We actually don't care about this. We care about this stuff out here. That's the cosmos uh, out here. And the next thing is Planck. Uh, this has, it's a mission that's just finished. The final results are coming out right now. Uh, they removed the Milky Way. They had a way to remove the Milky Way. So that's gone here. And so that's the distribution of warm and hot spots in the universe. This is coming from the very, this is the oldest picture. If the photons that you see here have traveled for 14 billion years until they've been detected by us now. Okay, and I, I wanted to give you a little bit of an impression what the measurement is. So this is the, a map of the earth with the altitudes, okay, at, at the resolution that Planck has. Now this is COBE, this was the previous satellite. Uh, in 1992, that they had a, they didn't have much, they didn't have the same resolution, the spatial, the angular resolution, and so if you would take a map of the Earth, that's what they would have seen. So you barely see the Himalayas, and that's it. You know, you don't see the bridge between South, North and South America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the resolution with Planck is much higher, and so you get now a map that's pretty good. Italy is still a bit difficult to see here, but it's pretty good uh, for what it is. And so that's now at the same level, uh, this, the mapping of the sky. Now, how do you interpret this image? Okay, this is lots of dots, blues and reds and green dots. So how do you interpret this? Well, so what you can do is you can make a model of the universe and you look at how these fluctuations, as they're called, look on the sky. And depending on how the geometry of space is, these fluctuations look slightly different. Okay, so if you have a closed universe, a universe that's on a sphere, then you, these are sort of washed out. The structure here is bigger. You see this is much bigger than here. Now in a flat universe where a triangle will always add up to uh, 180 degrees, the angles in a triangle, um, has this structure. And if you are in this inverse in what's called sometimes called a saddle universe, a saddle um, surface, then you see that these points are sort of put together, bunched together more than uh, here and certainly than here. And so this is a measurement of the sky, in this case from Boomerang, a very early measurement. And it turns out the distribution of, of hot and cold spots here very much uh, conforms to the flat universe. So from this picture, which was uh, published in 1998, 1999, um, we could, 20 years ago, roughly, uh, people could infer that the structure of the universe, the space in the universe must be mostly flat. Why is that? Because in a flat universe, a light ray goes straight. And so you have this. In a closed universe, the light rays are bent. Okay, they're getting closer together. Whereas in an open universe, the light rays are diverging, they're going out. And so if you're sitting up here, this is today, and you're looking back in a flat universe, you, see, you, you, you would say the age of the universe is this. In a closed universe with the same angular scale here, this closed universe would be younger, okay? Whereas an open universe would be older than um, the flat universes. And so that was a very important measurement at the time. Now let's turn to the dark side of the universe. What's the universe made of? How do we understand the universe? And what are dark matter and dark energy? Okay, here's where gravitation comes in. There are four fundamental forces. What I've talked about mostly are the, the weak and the strong force for the first three minutes. Um, I then talked about the 300,000 years, that's mostly electromagnetism, that's when the atoms formed. And now in, the, in today's universe, I'm gonna talk about gravitation. That's what's driving the universe today. And so the fact that the International Space Station goes around uh, the earth is due to gravity. It's not due to anything else. The fact that the moon goes around the earth is also gravity. And so in, how do you measure gravity? How do you, you can't see gravity in itself, but how do you measure it? Well, in the solar system, as it turns out, here's the sun. This is not to scale. Here's the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc. If you look at the orbital speed, how fast do these 
planets go around the sun. Mercury goes at 48 kilometers per second. Uh, Venus goes at 35. The Earth goes just under 30 kilometers per second, et cetera, et cetera. Now this line here is the gravitation. This is Newton's law. So this is not anything fancy, but this is Newton's law. And the fact that these planets, turns out I actually included Pluto here as well. The fact that these planets lie exactly at that, along this line means that 99.9987% of all the mass in the solar system is in the sun. Okay, the sun dominates. And so we here, all the planets are just test particles. The only planet that makes a little bit of a difference is, is Jupiter. Everything, everybody else is really just a, a sand cone going around the sun. Okay, so why do we even talk about dark matter? Uh, this is the same energy di matter uh, content diagram of the universe, dark matter, dark energy, ordinary matter, atoms, that's us. So how do we talk about this? Well, so there's clusters of galaxies, there's the rotation of galaxies, and I'm not gonna talk about the other two things, uh, not much time. So the sun, as I showed you, the sun is sitting out here uh, in this Milky Way. Well, the sun turns out goes around um, the center of the Milky Way because there's gravitation, we're attracted to this. So, so we're going around um, this um, Milky Way center. Now, this is done in 22 million years. So one turn here is 22 million years. None of us will, will actually see this. Turns out the sun itself has been around um, the center of the Milky Way has done maybe uh, 25, 20 to 25 turns so far. But there's another way to do this. And this is the Nobel Prize of this year for uh, Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Gaze. Uh, Roger Penrose did the, the theory part. These are the observers. And so what you have here is um, this is like the Earth going around the sun. This is stars going around some dark thing in the center of the Milky Way. So the, the dots are stars that are just moving around. Now, the, the, the ellipse is the orbit of uh, a star called S2 that's going around this dark center where you don't see anything every 16 years. Okay, so you have the years counting on the lower left. This is 36. Uh, and so uh, it's going to come back by 2000. I can't do the calculation, 46 or something uh, later. Uh, 2050, too late for us. And so by the fact that this, that this, um, this star moves around this un invisible uh, object, you can infer that down here must be a mass of 4 million times the mass of our own sun. And that's attracting all these stars. And that's the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. OK, now there's another way. Uh, so it seems like the Nobel Prizes are, go are all going for these gravitational effects. Um, there's another way of seeing this. And this is uh, done by Didier Curlot and Michel Maillor, who won the Nobel Prize last year, that um, what you see here is the, the star, this star here, that's the thing you see. And you see that the lines move back and forth. And that's because this planet, which is not seen in the observations in here, is pulling on this star. And, and so through the change of these velocities that the star uh, has, you know there is a unseen mass, a planet that you cannot directly observe in most cases. Chaos is now trying to find those guys. OK, but so far you cannot see them directly. And so um, that's another indication of gravity. Now, if you look at our Milky Way and you look where the distribution is of, of these things. So if you have all the mass in the center of the Milky Way, then you ex ex expect this curve here, which is the Kepler curve. It's Kepler's uh, law. So you, you would expect this. And this is the measurement. And you see this is the sun. Uh, and so you see that the measurement goes stay up here. Now, the only way to explain this is that you have additional matter. They call it corona in this case. Isn't that funny? They call it corona. I didn't, I didn't realize this until I said it now. Um, but uh, this is the solar system, as I explained to you. Now, this corona, the halo here, this is the dark matter. Okay, this is stuff that's in addition that we haven't seen so far uh, until now. Okay, and this is the measurement uh, for Andromeda, so it's there. 
And Fritz Zwicky was one of the people who pointed this out. Actually, as a matter of fact, his, one of his daughters is suing other people that he was the one who coined the term dunkle materie. This is in 1933. Um, and he did it on a different uh, explanation. His explanation was the velocities, this is the radius of a cluster. This is the coma cluster of galaxies in the northern sky. The velocities should follow this line here. And they actually, they should, yeah. And uh, they should follow a much smaller line. That's what, that's what uh, it, it is. And so the fact that the velocity dispersion here is much larger than expected means that there must be ad additional matter that we don't see. Okay. So dark matter is not measured in the solar system. It dominates the clusters. This is, this is what uh, Zwicky found out. So it dominates the galaxy clusters. And it uh, significantly contributes to the outer reaches of the galaxies, including the Milky Way. Okay. Uh, the things I didn't talk about, it determines the evolution of large scale structure. And uh, it is a possible explanation for the discrepancy between the nuclear synthesis of the Big Bang and the deceleration of the cosmic expansion. Again, something that I didn't mention. Dark energy. Well, so now let's talk about this bit. Why do we even talk about this bit? Well, the, um, I should probably finish. That's a, that's a signal I should be finishing. Um, the expansion of the universe should be slowed down because there's matter in the universe. And so I come back to uh, uh, Gustav Tamman here, uh, Andreas Gustav Tamman, sorry. Gustav Andreas Tamman, get it right. Um, who was one of the key players in this uh, together with Alan Sandwich. So they set up a program with they, which they ran over 25 years um, of observations to get into what they call the pure Hubble flow here. So they had to step out very laboriously and essentially understanding all of ast astrophysics to do this. Um, here's a Hubble diagram. I'm not showing you much about Hubble diagrams, but this is distance from us. And this is velocity as, as the objects are flowing away from us, okay? And this is uh, a modern version of a Hubble diagram. Hubble's diagram would be sitting in here. And so um, the, the important bit here is they line up very well on this line, pretty much. We don't know which of these lines is exactly the right one. Uh, that depends on the Hubble constant, the value of the Hubble constant. But the other important bit is that the green points here, all the green points are supernovae. Uh, supernova type 1a, uh, specific, specific kinds of supernovae that are giving us that measurement. All the galaxies and so the stuff inside are much harder to measure. So this is the typical picture. This is a picture that uh, George Gamow uh, showed in uh, 1947. Uh, the universe is like a balloon that's blown up. Uh, here's the picture that uh, uh, Gustav Tamman put together uh, for uh, spatium number three in 1999. So you have a cake and the raisins in the cake. And as the cake ri rises, um, the raisins all move away from uh, each other. Okay, so that's uh, his explanations for this. Now, uh, how do we do this graphically? So we have here time. Uh, this is the past. This is the future. So I won't be saying much about the future, but I can say something about the past. Here, we have something like the mean distance or the size of the universe, whichever way you want to see this. Um, this here is given by the Hubble constant, the fact that the universe is expanding. We know what well, we try to measure the expansion rate today of the universe. So that's this slope here. And so uh, this is the measurement, redshift and, and objects. And for different models of the universe, this is one specific model, a model that in infinite future will come to a stop. The expansion will stop. Uh, in the future. Here is a model that's closed. That's a heavy universe. So the universe will expand and sometimes in the future it will collapse again. And here's a universe that's empty. Uh, so a universe that's completely empty. There's no deceleration. This just expands unhindered and just keeps on going. And so um, uh, the interesting thing is if you then put a value in here for the Hubble constant, this is a, a favorite value today for some people you get different ages. And uh, you see a problem right away. Uh, if you have a closed universe, you get a, a universe that's only 7 billion years old. But we know that the old stars are about 13 billion years. Um, so um, you have a problem in a closed universe. 
And so uh, that's what we try to measure. And the way we measure this is through supernovae. So you have a star, a triple star in this case, that explodes. So that's in uh, 1987, in, uh, from the 20th to the 23rd of February. That's before, that's after, of course, you need an arrow to know where the before is. Uh, and that's after, uh, that's the first naked eye supernova in 400 years that we could observe. And this is how this uh, works for the, uh, the measurement. So we have uh, what we call a light curve as a function of time. You see uh, how the object gets brighter. So here's the supernova, uh, it gets brighter and it gets red very fast. Uh, as you see here, and these are the light curves that are, are, we're measuring. And what we're measuring is uh, this bit up here. So we're trying to measure the tip, the, the maximum of this light curve, and that tells us how far these supernovae are away. And the way they do this is like this. Uh, you have uh, two bulbs that are the same uh, luminosity. You move one bulb away. Um, in this time, in this uh, case, you move it by a factor of two, you only get a quarter of the light, and you move it a factor of 10, you only get a hundredth of the light. And so if you know how bright, if you know what the luminosity is of your bulb, and you measure how faint it is out here, you know the distance. So that's what we do with the supernovae. And it turns out the supernovae are the best thing to do this uh, right now. Fritz Zwicky knew this all along. So he said, don't believe in any of these methods using galaxies to measure distances. The only re reliable way of determining extragalactic distances is through supernova investigations. And as a good Swiss, Gustav Tamman did it, and uh, I followed them as well. So we're doing this. So this is a Hubble diagram, and the gray points here are all supernova measurements, and the dark dots are averages of these various measurements, and you see how they line up. Now, I have here different universe models. So this red line is a flat universe, so an empty universe, nothing's happening here. Um, so that's the red line here. And then uh, we have a filled universe, sorry, this one, the uh, yellow one, that's a filled universe. Uh, so that has a lot of matter in it. And this one is a, is a hypothetical universe. We wouldn't know how to, how to make this, but that's one where that's dominated by the cosmological constant to dominate by dark energy. And this uh, uh, bluish one is a concordance model. So that's a mixture of uh, these two. Uh, and so that will be lying in here. Now, uh, what I've done here, I've essentially, I've removed the slope. So everything here is relative to the red line relative to the empty universe. And in an empty universe, um, you cannot be here. You cannot be emptier than empty. So you cannot be up here. Now, if you look at the data, the data are right there. And so that was a big surprise. Nobody could know, could, could really work out what it was. But um, so what it really means is these supernovae are lying out here. So they're outside the parameter space that we had looked at. And that means you have to add a new parameter to fix this, and the new parameter is called dark energy. Now, if you find the acceleration of the universe, this is Brian Schmidt, Adam Rees, and Saul Perlmutter, they, you get the Nobel Prize. So that was done in 2011. So what does it mean? Well, the distant supernovae are further away than in a freely in an empty universe. So somebody, something must have pushed them away. So there must be a repulsive component in the universe. And it turns out, everything in the universe goes back to uh, uh, Albert Einstein. He actually had an equation. So I showed you the Einstein field equations. Well, I omitted one term, which he introduced as a, as after the fact, which is called the cosmological, he called it the cosmological term. We now call it the cosmological constant. Fits the bill perfectly. So the cosmological constant is actually the thing that we believe. So let me summarize. I'm, I'm, I'm just about done. Dark matter and dark energy are part of the theory of gravity. Uh, they're part of the relativity theory, but they come in with opposite signs. Dark matter is attractive, like our matter, uh, but um, dark energy is repulsive. I just said that. Um, so they, they are, dark energy is a characteristic of space and acts like a repulsive force. That's what I just said. Now, I have a small coda, which is the calibration of the Hubble constant. This is really at the heart of what Gustav Thomas wanted to do. Um, this is the old way of doing this. So you're having what's called the distance ladder. So you, you 
you're moving up from one calibration to the next calibration to the next calibration. And every time you do this, you add uncertainty. Adam Reese is, is the master of this. And so he's now managed, this is an older slide, but he's now managed to reduce this to two steps. Uh, um, Taman and Sandich had six to eight steps to do this. It was really, really hard. Uh, was the best they could do at the time. Now, <clears throat> Adam Rees got it down to two steps. And so he thinks 4% error actually thinks it's even better than that. And so that's the summary of what he's done. This is calibrating the nearby universe. So this is geometry. This is using um, various ways to measure distances. And then you calibrate what's called Cepheid stars. These are variable stars. You calibrate them. Yeah, then you use the calibration of the Cepheid stars to calibrate this type 1a supernovae. So these are these diagrams here and here. And then you take the supernovae and you calibrate the distances. Okay. And so that's the supernova Hubble diagram. And that's uh, what, how he measures a Hubble constant. He measures a value. And the value he measures is about 74. Now there's a, another way of doing this. This is a beautiful, beautiful way to do this with gravitational ben, uh, lenses. Uh, Sherry Suyu is, is a, a prime mover in this, but the Holy Cow collaboration has a large fraction from, from Lausanne and also from Geneva as part of this. And so they use these, gal these galaxy lenses and they measure these uh, objects, these lens images, and through, through the time delay, they can measure the distance and the Hubble constant. And so this is what they find. So the Hubble constant is, is in units of kilo kilometers per second per megaparsec. So how the uh, uh, expansion excel. Uh, the further away you are, the faster uh, the expansion is, and so the expansion rate. And so the nearby measurements uh, come in at 74, uh, as I said, whereas the Planck measurement, the very distant universe, comes in at 67. And so we have a big thing here. The early universe gives a different number for the Hubble constant than the late universe, even though it's the same universe and it's the same theory. And uh, I'm skipping this, but um, so this is what, what I just showed you. These are the Planck measurements. This is the scale of the Hubble constant here. These are the nearby measurements. And these two parties here now claim there's a 4.4 sigma discrepancy. And um, the summary of this is if these measurements are correct, then either the cosmological model is incomplete so what I presented to you is only part of the story, or it's even wrong. And then you have to invite somebody else in a few years to tell you what the right universe is if somebody comes up with the right answer, because so far uh, we, we don't have anybody who really gives us a good idea. So um, what I presented to you is really what we think is uh, behind this. Uh, we call it the Big Bang Theory. I was about to uh, put up the cast of the, uh, of the TV show, but I didn't. Um, but it has beautiful foundations. The Big Bang Theory, as we would call the model of the universe, the early nucleosynthesis, I showed you this uh, deuterium helium as it's been done in Bern. Um, early radiation, the first cosmic, uh, so the cosmic, the first light, the cosmic microwave background. Here's a diagram. Uh, I don't expect you to really, un well, it's hard. This is the whole, um, it's a whole lecture series to, to explain this. But the point is that all these points, the points are the measurements and the red curve is the model. And you see how well the model fits all these points, hundreds of points. This is a staggering fit that's really coming out of the model. The age of the universe, I told you this, is now fixed. We now have a, a universe that's older than the oldest stars. And the expansion is all part of this uh, theory. Now, it doesn't explain certain things. What it does not explain is what's before the Big Bang. Uh, this you know, often goes under the uh, term inflation. Um, dark matter, dark energy are two additions to this model. We just added them. They work, but we don't physically understand what they are. And as I just showed you, we have a problem with the Hubble constant that's happening right now. Um, so uh, I, I've showed you pictures of Johannes Geis. I showed you a picture of uh, Gustav Thoman. Let me finish with um, the man from Gümlingen. Uh, the true age of discovery in astronomy is only just starting. And um, I wanted to come back to the 4%. I wanted to come back to the Earth, our living space. Um, our living space is 4% of 
the volume of the Earth. Um, it turns out we, the baryonic matter, are four percent of what the universe is made of, and the rest is dark energy and dark uh, dark matter and dark energy. But as it turns out, the only thing that can clump, the only thing that can form structure, is the four percent baryonic matter. So this is the thing that forms planets and stars and forms life, as uh, I try to show here. So in some sense, um, we, the bar baryonic stuff of this universe, we are the flower of the universe. We are that part that brings beauty into the universe, like the inner core and the man, like the core and the mantle of the earth have no functions other than keeping up the crust, okay? These things, dark matter and dark energy have, as far as we can tell, have no functions other than enabling life, supporting life as, it, as it's been developed. So we are the flower of the universe. And let me finish with a movie here uh, to show you a little bit of progress of science. So what you're gonna see here is the full sky and we've marked for every year, uh, so we started in the year 1900 and for every year we've marked where on the sky a supernova was observed, okay, where a supernova was observed. And so uh, this is starting in 1900, <clears throat> and you will see how uh, with the years, um, we uh, get more and more and more supernovae. Zwicky got into this business in 1936. These are Zwicky's supernovae. These are the ones he found mostly in the northern sky. And then after that, other people took over. Um, uh, Paul Wild, for example, who was a professor in, in Bern for many, many years, um, he was uh, doing this uh, from Zimmerwald. And now these are modern days. Uh, so as you see, as of the end of the century, uh, we now have thousands of supernovae that we observe every year. And with that, I want to stop. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Bruno Leibungut, for sharing your fascination about cosmology and the universe. It was a very interesting presentation. And I hope we manage now to check if there are some questions. So either in the audience, please don't be shy and raise your hand if you have any questions. And I would also like to remind those viewing participants from remote, actually quite a lot. We were most of the time above 100, if I saw it correctly. 120, 120 even, so that's okay. great. And I hope that from these 120, maybe there is one or the other question. So please put it in the chat or raise your hand. So the, first of all, there was... <laughs> There is the remark for an excellent talk. And if there, so let me see how I do this best, just a moment. Um, our speaker can see the chat, right? Yes, I actually see the chat. So yes, thank you. Okay. So I, I think we can somehow go from top to bottom. It's probably easiest. And there is a first one from Casey about scientific evidence for this. And I think this refers to this um, slide where you packed everything into one year, but I do not remember which one exactly she was asking for, whether a specific uh, sample there or the entire. Yeah. So um, uh, there, there are, so the question, part of the question could be, um, what's the evidence for isotropy and uh, homogeneity. This is this is one of the things that uh, are difficult to to assess. Um, the the in in some sense the microwave background uh, sky gives us an indication that at least to the level of one part in a thousand, the universe has been quite isotropic uh, and homogeneous. Um, this is something that we need to go well. We need to go back to. We we learn more and more. Uh, how difficult that is, uh, we put that in, well, we, this was put in into the theory to make it manageable. Um, it's difficult to, uh, to deal with these things uh, if you give up on, on isotropy and homogeneity. Okay, then let's check the next one. So first of all, congratulations for an excellent talk. Thank you. <laughs> if you can get the slide, I think 
they will be published on the website. They will be on YouTube. Okay, so Saliba the, just tells me that they will be on YouTube in about two hours. Okay, so I guess so that, that's the presentation. Yeah, okay, good, um, excellent. The first, and then one question he says from Professor, I just read it that everybody here yeah. also reads and understands it. From Professor Geis, I learned in a private discussion that deuterium in our human bodies originates directly from Big Bang. What's the reason for that? And this is the only isotope in us with such a long history. I am actually not qualified to, to answer that question. I'm not sure. This is the first time that I hear that the deuterium in our body would actually come from the Big Bang itself. Um, deuterium is, is destroyed fairly easily, uh, for example, in stars when it when they get too hot. Um, so I, it's the first time that I hear that, um, I have to say. Okay, no problem. Just let's move on. Uh, there's a question about when, <laughs> when Andromeda galaxy will clash with our galaxy. So um, the, I, I, I'm, I used to say five billion years. Uh, I think it's maybe even three billion years. So it's somewhere between three and five billion years. Now, there, there's a disappointing fact in here, which is we will not be able to see that. Uh, our sun will turn into a, a red supergiant just about that time. Uh, unfortunately, it will get too hot in about 1 billion year for the life as we know it to sustain the life as we know it. So it would have been fantastic to see that, that uh, galaxy crash into our Milky Way. Although as an ex extra galactic observer, I should say, I would be, it would be difficult because it's gonna be blocking a large fraction of the extra galactic sky. We'd have to look through that galaxy. But um, so three to 5 billion years, um, but as I said, it, it, it will have to be other life forms that will observe that. Then there is a question about the Hubble constant discrepancy. You mentioned if this could say something about the topological shape of the universe. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether it's, it's, it's going to say something about the topological shape of the universe. As I said, um, if our model is not quite right, if if the Einstein uh, uh, relativity that we use is not quite the right thing, or uh, if isotropy and uh, homogeneity are not the correct assumptions, then we may have ways uh, of doing this, of, of sort of fixing this. Uh, some ideas that have been floating is uh, what some people call dark radiation. So you add yet another component in addition to dark matter and dark energy into the model uh, that does the right thing at the right moment. So you could in principle do this. Um, I, it, it tells us that our model is not the, the latest, but as I often say, if I would have given this talk 30 years ago, I would not have talked about dark energy at all because people did not realize it was there. And so who, what, you know, in 10 years from now, we may have fixed that problem or we may not have fixed that problem. Um, so is it, is it, it's an indication that there is something not quite right, uh, whether it's topological or not, that's not for me to say, to be honest. As, as you're just mentioning dark energy, I, I just go to the second next. Are there any hints about how to search for an explanation for dark matter and dark energy? Yes, so um, maybe let's start with dark matter first. The various searches for the dark matter particle are on the way. There are theories that uh, hopefully will tell us, well, there are theories that are giving us indications in which, which directions to look. Uh, there was, I think last year or earlier this year, there was an indication from the LHC that they saw a resonance that could be something. Um, I, I'm not sure it was it was confirmed at this point. Um, so people are looking for these dark matter particles and we do really hope that at some point somebody will find one. Um, it's very, it's not easy. Um, we know that the neutrinos, for example, have mass and that will help with some of the mass uh, balance. But uh, at this point, it's too early to say uh, 
what it is. The, the easiest would really be to find it. All we can do with the dark matter at this point, we can sort of characterize how it clumps around galaxies and add in clusters of galaxies. Dark energy is a bit harder. Dark energy, you really need to measure essentially half across the universe to be able to um, measure it. It's very, very flatly distributed, very uniformly distributed in the universe, the way we think about this. There is an explanation, as I said, um, uh, Albert Einstein had introduced uh, the cosmological constant. And so the cosmological constant fits the bill very nicely. Uh, and the Euclid will tell us whether the cosmological constant is the right answer to this or not. Um, there is a problem with this. The value of this cosmological constant is very far away from any theory uh, that we have right now. And so that will be a big question to work on uh, for the next thing, yeah. Okay, let's, let's see. So there are a couple of questions. So um, at some point then I'm afraid we need to stop, but maybe I read a couple of more ones. Is this okay? Yeah, please go. Um, I think there is a question, why are not many works on cosmic voids compared to other aspects? So this is happening. Uh, Jochen Weller is, a, is here at the uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in, in Munich, and he told me he's doing uh, void statistics to understand the evolution of the universe. And so uh, people are doing this. I am not I just, I'm not, I'm not in a position to really talk about this because I don't understand enough about it. Um, it has to do with structure formation. And so you can look at the cosmic web, that's what some people do, or you look at what's not in the web, the cosmic voids. And um, so people are doing this. And again, Euclid and some of the, some of the uh, surveys that are happening right now, Ratchet surveys are analyzed in that direction. Um, I, I'm sorry. I can't, I don't know the answers. Um, okay, um, let's let's try to see if we can use the raised hands. I guess. Do you have to switch it on, Saligo? Yeah. Can you please unmute your microphone, then? Let's see whether this works. Leonard, you are raising your hand. Can you please? Yeah, go ahead. Does does not seem to work. We cannot hear you. <laughs> okay, then then maybe let's go to one or two more questions. General message here is a lot of compliments for a fantastic talk. I allow myself to summarize it in this way. Thank you. And uh, let's see what we have. There is a question about inflation theory. What is your opinion on that? <laughs> okay, so um, I love inflation. I think it's a it's a wonderful theory. Um, Alan Guth um, really had a brilliant idea, and it was followed by uh, Alex Starobinsky and, and uh, uh, what's his name? Anyhow, uh, um, it, it's really, it's, it's a great idea. Now, uh, it, has, it has a funny problem. It shifts the problem from, if you want, the earliest seconds into uh, the, just further back. Um, the structure has to come from somewhere. So the original idea of, of, the, of inflation was, of course, to, to get rid of monopoles, to get rid of, um, in, in normal models of the universe, you would have much more structure than we observe. And so you, you, get, uh, you smooth the universe tremendously in, in an inflation. But you still have to seed the quantum fluctuations that then later become the galaxies and the fluctuations that I showed in cosmic microwave uh, background. And so, so you just move the problem further back in some sense. You solve some things, but you move the problem back. I, as I said, I think inflation, I, I do teach it. Um, so I think, uh, I, I do think it, it's contributing to our understanding of the universe. Um, I don't think it's the ultimate answer. There, there's more to this. And, and there's problems like how do you get out of inflation um, when, you, when you turn the universe back from this exponential expansion into what we observe? You have to reheat the universe. How do you do this? Um, entropy problems and things like that. Um, so, uh, but 
it, it certainly is an important part of this. It's almost impossible to observe. Uh, turns out Planck has made a measurement that is very strongly supporting inflation, and that has to do with the, the slope of the um, uh, fluctuations, the density fluctuations. I would like also to check here in the lecture if there is a question here, maybe. Just that I do not overlook you, <laughs> please. Did you did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear that question. You have to repeat it. I'm so, so the question was: If we don't find the dark matter particles, are there other options? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, no, sorry, that wasn't a yes to to the answer. Um, that that will turn into a big problem. Um, I wrote I wrote a review twenty years ago, and I said we have to be aware that oh we have to be open enough that we might have to realize that dark matter and dark energy are uh, epicycles. They're just additions to the theory to make it fit, but it may be the wrong theory. If we don't find a dark matter particle, um, we really have to go over the drawing boards again and think very, very hard um, how you can create the structure uh, that is out in the universe that forms the galaxies. So, there are theories. There's uh, uh, the modified Newtonian dynamics theory, which uh, explains some of the things. It's not very favored right now. Um, it has issues like the, uh, my understanding is it's difficult to do gravitational lensing or understand the gravitational lenses uh, in MOND, but I'm not enough of an expert. So if we don't find a dark matter particle, we will have to think what else there is and what what could be the answer so it, it i think it's a critical thing we need to at some point hopefully find something or some indications of it okay then there was a question from the ec executive director tilman spawn that um, you showed how the different models of the universe resulted in different age estimates by introducing dark energy this seems not to be the case can we be certain of the age of the universe in the presence of dark energy? So, um, yes. <laughs> uh, once you, you use um, the dark energy as a cosmological constant, as, as I showed, you actually find a beautiful age of the universe at 14.7 billion years. Um, that's just uh, enough that's just perfect to explain uh, the age of the universe. Um, so it turns out dark energy fixed that problem. Um, that actually helped that problem because in the, as I showed you in all the other models, uh, we know that the universe is not empty. Not that we are a big part of, of, the, part of the universe, but we are in the universe, it's, it's not empty. And so, um, uh, it, it actually helps uh, solving that age problem. That was that was a big plus uh, when when that result came out because it came out just about at the same time as the cosmic microwave background measured the flat flatness of space, and those two things together just matched to what many people for many years called the concordance universe, the concordance model of the universe, because it was so fitting together. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more or so, and then we will we will save these questions that okay. are not lost for those that we will because otherwise <laughs> we will need a couple of hours, I guess. No, uh, but there are quite some. So there is one about um, the ideas to solve the tension on the Hubble constant that I uh, skipped before. I think uh, I'm trying to find it uh, from Felix Mira Mirabel. Nice. Ah, okay, yes, Mirabel. Um, Yes. Yeah, yeah, Felix. Well, thank you, Felix, for asking. <laughs> um, there are no good ideas, I would say. Um, I, I can give you my personal uh, idea about this. I believe, I, I, I cannot tell the errors on the Planck measurements. I've asked these people, uh, and the Planck measurement is very interesting. It's such a 
intricate measurement that you need a huge, a large team that works on this. And so it's very, from the outside, uh, it's next to impossible to independently test that. And so everybody tries to test the nearby measurements, the supernovae, the Cepheids and things like that. And people come up with things. Now, uh, I understand a little bit about the supernovae and the Hubble constant. And I do believe that currently the error bars are underestimated. I'm, I'm gonna go out on the limb here. I say this in public. I think that the error bars, the systematics in the error bars are underestimated in, in the RIS data, for example, uh, but also, well, it's harder for me to assess the gravitational lenses, uh, but for the RIS data, I personally would, would think there's some tricks that they're doing, which are all mathematically okay, and they're all consistent, but I'm a little nervous about what's happening there. So I believe we may have slightly larger error bars uh, than what, what they give. And so then the 4.4 sigma become smaller and we may have less of a tension. So it's, it's, it's a little, I think it's almost too early. Um, we, I'm part of a, a program that we try to measure the Hubble constant completely independently of Cepheids, of, of type 1a supernovae. So we, we just think we can do this in a different way with type 2 supernovae. And in hopefully three or four years, we will have an answer to this. It will have a larger error bar, but let's see whether, you know, where we kind of, where we come in. Okay. I think we close with one last question from the lecture hall, please. Yeah. Some of the plot of the evolution of the universe, it seems that the Earth and the Moon came in rather advanced age. I mean, if you look at the plot, you know, the expansion and uh, I mean, the lateral expansion, it, it appears at uh, a certain, let's say, in the middle age of the universe, right? First question, did you understand? No, sorry, I didn't. Okay, let's, let's give it a try like this. Oh, I think we cannot do it. <laughs> You want to? Okay. Yeah, it's it's too short. I think I can do it like this. <laughs> so. Thanks. Uh, from the uh, from the plot uh, of the evolution of the universe, you can really see that the uh, the dark energy seems to come in uh, at say in about the middle of the plot. Yes. Yes. So, is there any explanation for this that uh, it, it may have existed before, or so dark energy is is the way we think about this is a very um, strange creature. The acceleration of the yes. So dark energy is constant in space. Uh -huh. So if you think about density, matter density. If as the space expands, the density goes down and it goes down with uh, the volume. Um, if you, uh, radiation goes down with the fourth power of the, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the scale um, because there's redshift. Now, dark energy, at, well, the cosmological constant, if, if it is the cosmological constant, the cosmos, cosmological constant is constant with space, which yeah. means if space expands, the cosmological constant increases. The, the, sorry, the energy content, if you want, through the cosmological constant increases. And so as the density goes down for everything else, dark matter and matter and, and radiation, um, dark energy or the cosmological constant comes up and it becomes larger and larger and larger. And in a few years, a few billion years, mm -hmm. quite a few billion years though, um, the universe will be completely dominated by dark energy. And you will actually not see galaxy clusters anymore because they've been essentially redshifted away. It will be a very lonely universe because uh, all you see is a few neighboring galaxies if you're lucky. Um, um, well, we've got to be part of the Virgo cluster at that time, but that's it. And so you, you, this is a discussion, this is a philosophical discussion that people had uh, and still have. 
um, is this a, is this a funny moment in space in time where we have the matter density, dark matter density, and the cosmology, the cosmological constant density, about the same. The ratio is about one. You know, maybe it's a, it's it's two, but it's not a hundred thousand or one millionth or something like this. And so uh, we are in some sense in a special moment and the theorists are, are complaining about this a lot because the theorists plot time in a logarithmic scale, which means that half of their plot is below one second in time and the other half is 14 billion years. Mm -hmm. Now, the as you correctly observed, the dark energy has, if you want, taken over about six to eight billion years ago, just about half the age of the universe. And it will increase and it will, there's nothing to stop it unless, yeah, I, I, the way it is right now as a cosmological constant, it, there's nothing to stop it. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. And I think we, oops, we, we close here now. And as I said, Saliba will store the questions that they are not lost. So sorry for those that we cannot answer here now all life. And with this, I would like to thank very much our speaker again, Bruno Leibungut, for this very fascinating talk tonight. I think the audience showed you that it was uh, well attended, I would say, very well attended, actually. And uh, it's for sure very stimulating also to think about all the open questions and all the things we already know. And I think this is exactly the goal of our Proisi talks to exactly trigger this kind of stimulating process. So thanks again. I would like to close now the evening by also thanking all of you here in the lecture hall for listening and coming here today to the talk and those who were remotely connected for the interest in our Proisi lecture talk series. Of course, we will continue our activities, be it remote by remote talks in the future due to the ongoing corona situation, or hopefully very soon again, in-person talks with the usual and famous Aperos once the situation will again allow. What we can already say today as a small perspective, our next talk will be centered around Kiops about the fascinating first results that we have. We will announce relatively soon whether we will do this still already in this year to compensate a bit for the missing talks that we had this year due to the corona situation or then early next year, but for quite sure this will be before the next usual March slot where we usually have our first um, uh, talk. Details will, as I said, follow very soon. And Already you mentioned during the introduction, um, we cannot have the opera today. That's a pity, of course. We would like and have loved to discuss with you, Runa Leibundgut, and also among of us about the talk and all other space matters. We cannot do this today, unfortunately, but at least to those participants that are present in the lecture room, we would like to offer a very small thank you for coming here today. today tonight and for being our audience so please feel free to grab one of the mandel badlies that we will offer you as a very very small compensation for the opera that we cannot organize today and with this i would like to thank all of you again and wish you all a very nice evening thanks a lot bye well, thank you very much have a good evening <laughs>